So in this lesson, we'll look at how to interpret the the results of simulation. Particularly, we'll talk about feed paths because these can indicate a quite a different varieties of defects. Also, they help us to evaluate the performance of the feeding system. Okay, and to some extent, you can also look at feed path and start thinking about cold sheds and whistles. But that's not going to focus. I'm going to focus mostly on shrinkage porosity, which is like accounts for over half the rejections in Java counties of ferrous forms. Except for grey iron, low, low grade grey iron porosity is not a big problem. But anything above that, we have shrinkage porosity is a big problem. So let's look at this picture. On the, the first picture, and in fact, this casting is here. I don't have, this is a final casting, but I have another example in the lab which you have seen yesterday. I don't know. But if you see the casting, this is a railways insert casting, not Indian railways, but Australian railways. And this was one example which I, one of my first simulation case studies after I came to IIT, I think about 98 or 99, if I remember. So this was being produced by a foundry in Kolapur, Kolapur Sangri area. So what you see in this casting is a hole, a shrinkage, quite a big shrinkage cavity near junction. There. The picture on the right side shows you the feed paths. So I hope you can start looking at interpretation of feed paths. What can you see by this? One is you can see long feed paths and short feed paths. You see some, some feed paths are just dots. They're small and then it stops. You see somewhere here, short one. A short feed path simply means small gradient. Gradient is low, but doesn't mean temperature is high. Please remember always I need to worry about high temperature, first criteria, and low, low gradient, a second criteria. So the line color also depicts temperature. So in one, one single image, you get to see temperature and gradient both. Okay. So what is the color of that line? It is some brown color. On the other hand, you also see some long feed paths with a high color, which means high temperature color. So there are some feed paths which are long and converging in the feeder. And also you see some feed paths at the junction where you see the red circle there. So what about convergence? If they are converging in the part, then you have a local hotspot. That hotspot is feeding the local casting. It will end up with a shrinkage cavity. If they are converging in the feeder, excellent. The feeder is feeding the portion of casting until where the feed paths are coming from the casting. So I can, in one shot, I can look at temperatures, gradients, shrinkage defects, and performance of the feeder, and up to what distance the feeder will feed. This information you cannot get from temperature alone, plots alone. This is temperature plus gradient information. And these are three dimensional lines. Although you see in a two dimensional picture, if you turn the part, these lines are actually three dimensional lines. So what is the interpretation here? The feeder is, first let us look at feeder size. Is the feeder size right? If you look at temperature values, where do you see higher temperature? White is hot, followed by yellow, followed by brown and so on. Where is the highest temperature here? It's, it's in the part near the so first you immediately know that feeder size is not right. Excellent. Now what about feeder location? Is it able to feed the hot spot? No. Supposing I make the feeder bigger, double the size there. No. Will it feed the part? No. Not necessarily because those feed paths may go a little bit more in the casting but they may not reach all the way to hot spot. And also you can predict the defect in the casting. You can see that the, the junction of the feed pass at a high temperature, okay, there's where you see a hot spot. And that's exactly matching the defect. Some more interpretations here. Okay. The feed paths, two, two neighboring feed paths are continuously coming closer to each other, which means they are converging, or they are going away and maybe coming together back again. And that kind of can tell us what kind of a shape is that? Is there a re-entrained corner or internal corner? Is there an in-between reverse feeding happening? Is it feeding directionally or it is non-directional? Okay. So this, I can start looking at some more interpretation like this. Okay. One more interpretation I can do is, if there are a large number of short feed paths, coming and merging but stopping there only, they are not connecting and going further than that. They are coming from the surface, coming to the inside, stopping there. A large number of feed paths, which you see the red dots, they are all convergence points of feed paths coming from the side and stopping at the center only. When you see a series of, of those things, you know there is going to be central and cross. There is one more defect I can look at from a 
how this are coming but not merging but not going further than that. If you see the otherwise bottom of this casting, they all come in merging but they are moving ahead of that. In the center, they are not moving ahead. Okay, one more beautiful interpretation of central line. <coughs> so, if you want to start using these feed paths now for optimizing your feeding design, okay, you need all those inputs, okay, the right uh, inputs. And we will show some more uh, examples of you see the re intent corner and internal corner. In the inside corner, I don't know if you are able to remember all the what I am telling you, but feed path interpretation is science by itself, you can see that. But it's visual, it's immediately visual, you don't have to look at numbers. And visual interpretation is far more easy than looking at numbers. Is there any difference between optimization, near optimal and optimal solution? Like oh. that so many words. That's a true teacher's question. <laughs> All right. Finally, optimal is only theoretical. I mean, you will never reach optimal in life because you have finite amount of time to reach that. I'm, ask, I'm now saying from the point of a practical point of view. So, it's like uh, they say the classical question is, you know, there's going to be a parking problem near the supermarket. Okay, the optimal solution is you want to park right in the front of the, the main door. But as we approach, and this is one kilometer approach, will you go all the way to the door and try to park there? Because you're not sure whether an empty slot is there. So you keep going, the moment you get an empty slot, although it is still 300 meters away, you say, okay, I'll take a chance and I and, and stop there because I don't have time to go and wait. So in real life, always optimal means how much time you really have to, to optimize. End of the day. So you need to somewhere play balance and say, okay, I, have, I can spend only one day on that. I'll try three experiments, and then at the end of three experiments, I'll just choose which is the best. So that is, you can say, suboptimal, but it's optimal in the in the in the sense that it is optimal between quality and time, or quality and cost. Optimal quality, of course, is going all the way and optimizing all the parameters to get the best quality. So that is only in theory. So it's practical theory what I have said. I don't know if you have got the hang of what I said, but I'm sure industry could have really understood what I said. But finally, we can also start looking at shrinkage location, uh, shrinkage distribution, because the moment I have short freezing range or long freezing range, the feed pass picture will be same, but when you interpret and compute that and finally display the shrinkage cavity porosity, I hope you tried that yesterday in two different ways. If you same casting, same geometry, if you set it to aluminum alloy, long freezing range or let us say aluminum silicon alloy short silicon or maybe a steel same shape same sand mold you will see totally different results because feed paths are same but then you are now coupling the feed path interpretation with the material properties and therefore you are getting either a concentrated shrinkage cavity or a distributed shrinkage process so you can start interpreting and displaying this results. now I will come to some more examples and we will start with the same example which we tried from the about so now if you look at the feed path in terms of a graphic plot okay, and this also answers some more questions, how do we actually go about optimizing that? The graphic plot shows you the dotted line where the feeder is supposed to feed the casting but is not feeding the casting, the gradients are in the wrong direction. The solid black line is showing you gradients in the right direction. The right direction is only up to a short distance from the feeder. After that, the hot spot is feeding the casting and it is a wrong direction. But now we will see the good result and I will show you both the results and you can see comparison between them. So what we do now is, we do both the corrections. We increase the feeder size and we bring it down closer to the hot spot. By doing that, if you see now, the, the black lines are the original design and the green line is the new design. With the new design, the gradients are all positive from the hot spot in the casting to the hot spot in the feeder which means feeder is now completely feeding the cast. I mean it can't get any better than this in terms of interpretation. I mean, you, are, you are almost putting this <coughs> huge amount of computational results of temperature and time and all that into a beautiful simple graph which you can quickly interpret and there can't be any mistakes about it. Let us do one more example. Here is a little more complicated example of a, of a manifold and you see that there are four feeders now, common feeders feeding two castings and you just take one of those, I don't know if it is end one or a, I think it is end, end feeder, I think the yellow one. We take a cross section through that which is where you are getting a defect in the real casting. Okay. The green circle in the real casting picture is a defective area. Why is the defect coming? Because just near the casting, uh, sorry, just near the feeder, the neck is there and right after the neck there is a small hot spot in the casting. 
So there is a little bit of negative or reverse feeding from the hot spot towards the feeder. Not into the feeder, but towards the feeder neck. And that's a dotted line, black line. Here. How do I solve that? They just, in this case, they tried different solutions. They said, without changing feeder dimensions, just increase a little bit of bottom diameter and make it spherical feeder. Spherical bottom feeder. You know the spherical bottom feeder will have far more, not far more, but at least 10-15% more solidification time than a cylindrical feeder of the same, similar sizes, dimensions. By doing that, you can see that now, that uh, dotted black line is gone, replaced with a green line which is again completely positive. Sir, in that case, if we change the neck area, will it be uh, effective? Yeah, it can also be. So this is one of the many solutions here. Okay. So if you change the neck area, it might take care slightly, not sure unless you try it out in the simulation whether it will solve it completely. But definitely it will be better than this, but may not be completely positive. It may come down to maybe flat. Yeah. But you finally want to have a positive temperature gradient. And this is one solution they tried. You could have tried neck also. But sometimes you cannot increase the neck size simply because there is not enough connection available there. Or fatally becomes a problem. So you have usually limitation on that. One more example, and in each example I am showing a different solution methodology. I mean, not necessarily the same thing of increased riser size. You, know, you try different things in different ways. So if you see here, again you see a, a small hot spot next to the neck. And in this case, uh, I see a little bumpy ride of the temperature of the feed pass. But here what they did was to increase the neck size. And now by doing that, the dotted black line is replaced by a green line with a completely positive gradient throughout. And the casting is able to be There are two ways of optimizing a feeder size. First of all, you have to do some hand calculation anyway. The modulus calculation, all those things. Although they can be automated and computed, the computer calculation of the modulus and feeder dimension is only a starting point. You never know what really works because the actual casting has many more parameters. The casting geometry, the next size, the next, the surface curvature of the casting there, and so the heat transfer coefficients. Is there a core inside there? And is there a gating near there or gating runner there? All these complications do affect the solidification time of the feeder and the casting. All this you cannot do hand calculation. So hand calculation or modulus based calculation only gives you the starting point of the riser. Now you have two options again there. You can take a whatever you do hand calculation of computed value. You can take double the size of that. Okay, and see if it works. Okay. By doing that, you are starting from a higher quality perhaps, but definitely lower yield, which is also very important for Indians. So the best solution which, which we found, which optimizes, now I am talking about your answer, your question's answer. What do you want to optimize here? You want to optimize the num, you want to finally get a good quality casting, there is no discussion about it. But you want to get a good quality casting at the highest possible yield. But you want to do these two with the few, fewest number of steps. I don't have time to do 100 iterations of feed. I'll do maybe 5 iterations, 10 iterations if you have a lot of time. That's about the maximum. So in 5 iterations, how do you get the best quality, best feeder size? What you finally found as a nice guideline is, you start with a slightly undersized riser. And fortunately, when you do that modulus calculation with 20% factor of safety, which is feeder size is equal to, or feeder modulus is 1.2 times the casting hotspot modulus, or the neighboring hotspot modulus, that actually gives you a reasonable starting point which is just balances the, the casting hotspot. It is never gives you a, a proper riser. So you start with that, and you do simulation on the computer. You will find that the feeder is working just borderline feeding at the hot spot. Then increase it slightly by 5%. It may just about work, may not work. Increase by another 5% and check again. Usually it might work. So by doing that, one is you are taking care of your, your uh, quality because in three steps, you know how much to increase and then your feeding is taking place, feed paths are nice, temperature profiles are nice, no hot spots in the castle. You can verify all this. You are also automatically ensuring your yield is high. Because you're starting from a deliberately small size and you're putting only that much size that is works. You're not unnecessarily increasing beyond that. And by starting at a borderline, you're making sure your number of iterations is only just about 3, 4. You don't have to worry about more than that. Maybe sometimes you need to do additional iterations on the neck. But feeder size, you can get it right in 2, 3 iterations. So in 3 iterations, you got the right quality 
and the right and the, and the maximum possible yield. That is the true optimization in terms of engineering design, engineering simulation. It's clear this? Yeah. 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 So that's what in a way it means here. And uh, now we'll show you again one more practical example of how it was done. Uh, this is a benchmark case which I also show you in the software comparison later. But here you see the uh, without any feeders, you see only a, a sprue connected directly by two gates to two cavities. And if you are wondering what are those vertical bumps on the on the right side casting, uh, they are vents, but also they are thermocouples which are putting in the casting to find temperature differences. So we have a nice data of this benchmark casting which can be used to uh, to test any software. Any simulation software, and we are actually doing that, and I'll show you in the next next lesson. But how, now I'll show you how we optimize this test. So the feed pass, if you see, what is the interpretation here? So they are converging in two three places. The main convergence is in the feeder itself. The main convergence is in the feeder itself. All other convergences are not stopping; they are moving ahead. In fact, this is a picture of how a good feed pass should look like. This is a well designed, I mean the central portion boss, if you treat it as a feeder then it is working fine but if it is part of the part then it is it's a defective casting. So it is a question of how you interpret that. But if the central big portion was a feeder then this is definitely a very well designed. The feed paths are looking very good. All of them are connected, all of them are converging and they are going inside the thick portion. So thick portion is feeding the rest of the casting seamlessly. Okay. And you do see a beautiful correlation between that convergence and the hot spot in the thick section. Okay, no, no doubt. Here. Now here you see an iteration of a feeder. So on the thick portion, they now put a feeder because you need to feed the hot spot in the casting. And uh, and the feeder size is slowly increased. As you see, the feed pass. The, there's only one red line there. So that red line is the last convergence of the feed pass. We are not showing all the feed pass to avoid a visual. Uh, uh, confusion there. So the red line shows you the where the feed paths are finally stopping. The red dot shows where the feed paths are all converging and stopping finally. Okay. So if you see in the first one, dia 60 and height is 80, first iteration, yield is theoretical yield. Please, this yield is theoretical yield. Yield has no meaning if your castings are, are defective. Then yield is zero actually. So it's only theoretical yield, not a practical yield. You have to put the whole casting back into furnace. So you see as the diameter of the feeder is increased and height is also increased, I think they are keeping the diameter by height ratio constant, okay. slowly the convergence points moves up, moves up, moves up and the, the first, the last third picture in the top row, it is just reached, crossed into the neck, beautiful. Then you want to play a little more safe, you want to push it into the feeder a little bit more, you can go into dia more diameter bottom, but the last one, bottom right, maybe over safe design. You are sacrificing yield is come down to 50 to percent. Okay. So you may not need to do that much, maybe you can come down, scale down to the bottom left one. Okay. All these iterations, four five hours we are done. So six castings poured in a shop floor versus six castings on a one hour instead of one day on a shop floor. So you say that much time. But also this insight you will never get on a shop floor. This is again the truth and as close to truth as it can be. So Again, some visual pictures of uh, now with the feeder, if you see. So if you see again beautifully on the first uh, picture, feed path picture, you see two convergences almost or a, a series of, you, you, I mentioned to you, the feed paths are converging but they are stopping and a series of stops are there, okay. So first stop starts from somewhere here it stops, right. They are, they are not meeting up. It is stopping here itself, stopping, stopping, stopping and again there is convergence here. So if you remember, this is definitely a shrinkage cavity. This is also possible shrinkage cavity and these are all center line shrinkage. So this shrinkage throughout from the top convergence to bottom convergence. And that is what you actually see in the in the cut section of the feeder. On left side there are uh, feeder uh, path which are merging. So we will not get defect at that particular merging point. They are merging but they are not stopping. Stop. Actually, unfortunately you see the lines like this. But if you just look at a single line and you follow that, the line which starts here doesn't stop here. It actually is going all the way and ending here. I mean ending here, sorry. Okay. Uh, actually the corners in those castings 
And in the picture, if you go back and <coughs> the slide is there, you do see three pictures, if you remember. You do have a picture of temperature as well as uh, feed path, and also I think thickness also picture is there. And there, corner, the sharp corner there, you're getting a crash there. So by putting a small, a, a good fillet, usually you can take care of most cracks. But then it should not be machined later and things like that. That's additional cost. So if you remember, just those four high values together will be you. Cracks, and I can easily see the simulation. Could you all, please all repeat? Uh, four high values again, which are? High temperature, yeah. high gradient, high cooling rate, and high thickness gradient in the part. Okay, to summarize this part, we have, uh, so feed paths are a beautiful way to interpret the results of simulation. So any software which can give you the temperature gradient values is a very valuable one because you can use that to do visual interpretation and visual optimization of the getting system and feed, sorry, feeding system. And then uh, we can look at many things in, by using feed paths. I have covered a few things here, including like nature of the feed. Is it a convergent or divergent flow? Is it going to have, uh, can do use for sinkage prediction. You can use for assessing the location and size of feeders. Later on, we will see also feed aids can be interpreted using this. Okay. And what we are now doing uh, in our current research, and hopefully by next year, we should be able to finish that, automatic auto optimization of the feeding, entire feeding system. Not just feed optimization, which you must have seen yesterday, but feeding and feed aids are also uh, what we call as um, multivariable. Feeder height and feeder diameter and neck diameter and neck height and neck notch angle and maybe the chills and maybe the insulation, everything put together, we should be able to automatically optimize. Maybe it will take a day, 24 hours. After 24 hours, you get the best possible combination of the feeding system to minimize your cost because we are also tracking costs all the time. I don't know if, again, if you use cost function yesterday, some of the equations are still not uh, completely fine-tuned. We are trying to correct that. But we have an underlying <coughs> cost model. So we can always look at quality and cost optimization and we can get it done. That's the whole goal of the Okay, so we stop here.